Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Hello everyone, I'm Troy Moling and thanks for joining us today on Market Journal. Hope you're having a great day. We've got a jam-packed show for you this week. And beginning the broadcast, last week's prospective plantings report from the USDA is forecasting Nebraska farmers to plant slightly more than 19.8 million acres of crops this planting season. And one way that's going to happen is by making sure your planter is in top condition. Market Journal's Bill Dodd talked with Dave Panko to understand why planter maintenance is one of the first steps for a successful growing season. Having your planter in top condition is important for many producers. This is particularly true for producers utilizing reduced and no-till operations. In short, a well-maintained planter will give seeds their best chance to flourish throughout the growing season. A majority of the physical responsibilities for pushing soil, placing seed, and getting things off on the right foot rest squarely on the shoulders of the planter. Making sure this piece of equipment is in top working order will give you the best possible start for achieving maximum yield performance. Really for, for any row crop farmer, in my opinion, the planter is their most valuable piece of equipment. The biggest impact on any crop is largely determined by the planter and the performance of that planter. We need to have seeds placed accurately and provide an even emergence of that crop um, to, to gain the, the highest yield. Keeping proper maintenance on your planter is, is probably very, very undervalued. Um, in my opinion, growers need to take the time to understand what proper maintenance is on each component of their planter. Uh, out in, in front of the row unit itself, you're going to have your row cleaner that's going to clear out any residue or root ball that you have in the way or dirt um, to provide a clean surface for, for the planter row unit behind it. So then behind that you have a true V disc that's going to form a furrow for that seed to drop in. And the depth of that true V disc is going to be determined by a gauge wheel that, that, that is right next to those discs. And up above at the same time when this furrow is forming, you want to have a meter that is singulating and dropping the seed as accurate as possible and that seed is falling down through a seed tube and placed in the bottom of, of the, the seed trench. And behind that, um, you can be, as some guys, if they choose to do so, um, would, would drop fertilizer in the seed trench. And then behind that, you would have some sort of, of closing wheel or closing system that's going to close that, that seed trench up. With so much happening in one fell swoop, it's easy to understand why proper maintenance is so crucial to your operation. One of the first thing your planter does is clear debris and move soil with the row cleaners. This will be a good place to start as you may run into problems including yield loss without proper maintenance of this component. Most likely you're going to either clean too much or not enough residue or dirt ahead of your row unit which is going to cause uneven emergence or possibly leave seeds on top of the ground and you would cause um, basically a loss in yield potential. For most row cleaners, you're going to have a linkage or an, an arm for a floating row cleaner that is, and you need to check that linkage as well as the bearings that on the wheels themselves. Um, those need to be um, serviced um, every year and if you do have a fixed row cleaner, you also want to check those bearings on, on those wheels as well and make sure that, that they are, are properly maintained. Next on the agenda will be to check your V-disc or opener. This component is responsible for opening a consistent furrow and placing seed at a consistent depth. Your biggest concern with this particular part will be the diameter of the disc and the functionality of the gauge wheels. So with any uh, true V-disc or any opener, the, the first place we start is a diameter of the disc. The OEA, OEM manufacturers are going to have specs of when those need to be replaced. For a John Deere planter, 
brand new, those discs are 15 inches. And at a 14 and a half inches or less, those discs need to be replaced. For a Case IH planter, brand new, those are 14 inches. And at 13 and a half inches, those discs need to be replaced. But any of those um, specs you can find from, from an OAM dealer, uh, especially properly shimming those discs. Um, so that's the, the gauge wheels are lined up to the, the, the true V disc and those need to be properly shimmed so that they, they press against the true V and provide a good depth gauge with that. There are many options available to producers when it comes to applying down force or down pressure during the planting process. Too much or too little, and you could wind up costing yourself over the long haul. However, there are some extra measures you can take to ensure that doesn't become an issue. To set down force correctly, we need to have clarity on what the row unit is doing itself. I mean, there's sensors we can mount on the row unit that will tell you if there is a smooth ride and if that row unit is staying on the ground at all times. Those, those sensors can be placed and you can have those readings um, in the monitor. Secondly, we can put a, a weight pin on the row that will tell us the amount of weight we're pushing down on the row. Typically, when a, a grower is planting, if he is applying more than 450 pounds of pressure on that row, you're going to be causing compaction. So between the, the sensor and the weigh pin, we can determine if we're providing enough pressure or too little pressure when we're planting. Farm machinery is an investment. As such, you'll want to achieve the best return possible on that investment. Failing to get a proper start in the best possible seed bed, crops will ultimately be challenged from the onset to grow to their full potential. With proper maintenance and some fine tuning, your planter should get your growing season started on the right foot. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Bill Dodd. Thanks, Bill. Now we could spend the whole show on planter maintenance, but we only have so much time. So if you want to learn even more, head over to the Market Journal website where you'll find some extra resources. Time now for markets and the latest crop progress report from the USDA tells us planting is starting up. It says only about 2% of the nation's corn crop is in the ground, and Nebraska has yet to have any data reported, but we can expect that to change over the next several weeks. Darren Fessler of Lakefront Futures and Options joined me this week to discuss the bullishness in the market and what we could see going forward. Well, you know, I think that if you, if you look at the, the pace of progress as far as planning as a whole here, the conditions are going to be very, very good compared to even if we were thinking six weeks ago. So I do think over the next few weeks, we're going to probably see a lot of planters hitting the dirt here over the next week, probably by the weekend if, if we don't get a tremendous rain in certain areas. But I, I think we're going to see a lot of progress. I know I spoke to a lot of clients here uh, this week in uh, central Illinois. I know the planters are hot and heavy going uh, as of Monday of this week. They were running hard. So I anticipate this thing to you know, get off to a really good start here. It, it doesn't look like the the uh, the weather pattern is going to be threatening, like we're going to keep the planters out of the fields. It, I think these guys with the, the new updated planters that, that are, you know, more and more guys are getting, um, we're able to get this crop in in, in a pretty quick fashion. I, I think that's going to be the case here in 21. And again, I think if you look at the seed bed so far with those, those rains, as a whole, across the Western Corn Belt have really, really helped. I think the conditions are going to be rough to a really good start. We've had over a week now since last week's grain stocks and prospective planting reports. How's the market been reacting? Well, my initial reaction to the planting intentions was, wow. I, would, I just kind of had to sit back and I'm like, where, where are all these acres, <laughs> you know? And so uh, the, the biggest thing for me, I look at that bean number, 87.6, and and I'm, I'm still shaking my head. Where are these acres at? And how are we possibly, uh, even if we have a really high bean yield, and if these numbers are verified, we're going to be throughout the whole year uh, very, very tight on bean, uh, bean stocks. And I think between now and say the end of June, when we have the next uh, planning intentions report or the planning report and then the quarterly stocks, I, 
I do think we're probably going to find some some acres on the both the corn and the beans. If we don't, that's where I think things could still get kind of hairy. Now, I think the market in itself right now, it's comfortable where it's at, given where I think the crop conditions are and how the planning progress will will come along here in the next couple of weeks. So not that we can't see higher levels, but I do think you get to the back half of summer, I still think these beans could be pretty, pretty wild. Soybean basis has been climbing too, huh? Well, the, and I think that's something the basis is telling you. It, it's telling you that we do not have the physical beans on the countryside. And, and again, if you get to, say, firecracker day, realistically, how many producers are really going to have any beans left? Or beans let, have not been spoken for? I, I think it's out of the, all the clients I work with across the country, I think it's going to be probably less than 10, maybe 5% are even going to have beans left to even sell. So that's where I think that you get to the July 4th, the, definitely the back half of July into August. I think these August, November, Sep, November bean spreads could be very, very explosive. I know they're at a big inverse now, but I think they could really start to skyrocket here as the market is trying to convince the Delta producers who planted beans to get those beans out and get them to the market ASAP. Because I think, again, if we are dealing with the type of acres we're dealing with, if we're dealing with the type of supplies we're dealing with, uh, you know, these markets could feel like they're comfortable, like they're not moving. We have all this bull stuff. Just stay patient here. The real story, I think, is going to play out here later on. You know, after these types of reports, our minds will often go to how are corn and soybean producers going to be affected? But we need to remember cattle producers too, right? Well, I'm a big believer. You're, if you're going to have high corn prices, you probably need to have high cattle prices as well, too. You know, the Packers are making hand over fist and good, good, good margins right now. So I look at the trend at where the cattle are currently going. They've been out on a very, very nice trend. Do not be surprised if we do see a little bit of setback, a little bit of breather in these markets. These both the fats and feeders have had a pretty good run here. But keep in mind, I think that you're entering that grilling season. People have been tied up for the last year. They're going to get out. They're going to eat the meat. I'm very bullish meat still. Uh, and on the both the, the cattle and the hog side, I still think there are some higher levels to come here. But do not be surprised, like I said, to see a little bit of setback till we push a little bit higher to new highs uh, later on this year. Can you give us an update on where fund positions are? Yeah, fund positions, funds are really long corn, long beans, long wheat. They're long a lot of things at this point. That in itself could be a little bit of a threat to this market here if the crop gets off to a good start here. If we get off to a good start, we maybe say, hey, you know, they may take take some chips off the table, not, not to be surprised there. Again, it comes down, I think, at this point between now at the end of June, it, we're going to have to continue to use what the USDA is uh, assuming far as yields. And if we have some hiccups there, I do not, uh, I would not hesitate to believe that the funds would add, add record length potentially in the corn complex and potentially beans here if we have some hiccups. Okay, Darren, really good insight today. Let's end things with any marketing or risk management advice that you'd like to leave us with. You know, with these current levels and, and, and with the margins we have at this point here, we're never out of the market. So if you feel like you need to make some cash sales here to take advantage of these cash prices and board prices, totally fine. You can still take a look at call options or calls to defend that position all the way through November or October on the beans. I still think that is a very, very good position. If you're looking at where a guy probably should be sold, my current rec is about 20%. I'd love to see about 30% both on the corn and beans before the planters roll. Don't know if we'll get it. We're going to stay patient here. I'm still targeting on December corn, 507, 508. It's my next target. And 1320 in November beans. Next week, we'll be joined by another Darren for the markets. This time, it'll be Darren Newsom. So if you have a question you'd like for me to ask him, email us or get a hold of us on social media, and I'll pass your question along. Next up, planning prescribed burning is currently a hot topic. With a limited number of days available to conduct a burn, having a plan in mind is key to success. Market Journal's Matty McIntosh spoke with range and forage specialist Jerry Valeski to learn more about how this practice benefits landowners and ecosystems. Prescribed burning is a, is a pretty common practice uh, in Nebraska and many other states as well. And in Nebraska, one of the primary reasons or objective prescribed burning is used is to control eastern red cedar trees. Now, there are some 
um, other cases too, such as on CRP lands where uh, prescribed burning um, is really just used to uh, clean up some of the old dead growth and rejuvenate uh, some of the grasslands. If you think a burn is right for your operation, you should make a detailed plan to keep the burn as efficient and safe as possible. We encourage uh, producers that, uh, that are thinking about a prescribed burn is that they do need to do some planning ahead of time to make sure that it's done safely and correctly. Many times in the spring like, like this, there's um, relatively few days that the prescribed burn can be conducted. You might have the wrong type of wind or direction of the wind. The winds are too strong. The relative humidity is, is too low. So it, it really narrows down the window when uh, prescribed burning can be done. When you have a, a group of people together that are gonna be working on the burn that have some experience in prescribed burning, and, and the planning, you know, there's there can be different levels of prescribed burning in terms of how easy they might be to, to pull off uh, the topography that you're dealing with, uh, the size of the unit that's to be burned. And, you know, even in some cases, uh, planning a, a year ahead of time um, can be required because of the, you know, potential difficulty in conducting a certain type of burn. In, in some other cases, if it's a relatively small field that's going to be burned, producers will you know, mow um, a, a burn line to help uh, control that prescribed burn that's going to take place. A prescribed burn can't just be done on a whim. To conduct one, you need a permit from your local fire chief. There's also groups of fellow landowners experienced with prescribed burns who may be able to help you. Uh, one other important thing part about that plan, too, is have a, a fire or burning permit from your local uh, fire chief, um, and that's required within the state of Nebraska. And then also, I think, you know, with relate in relation to this prescribed burning, we're seeing a lot of landowner groups forming uh, across the state and have been in place for a number of years. And so these are actual landowners that are uh, partner up with each other, and then they um, have been uh, getting some equipment and now already have some experience in prescribed burning. And so they're, they're sharing their labor with each other and helping uh, conduct these prescribed burns. If you'd like more information, Jerry says there's many resources available through both UNL and other groups. The University of Nebraska does have some extension publications related to uh, how to plan and conduct a, a prescribed burn. There's several um, um, non-university agencies such as Pheasants Forever, uh, Game and Parks Department also have uh, some staff that are um, have expertise in prescribed burning and, and are really willing to help out uh, some of the individual land landowners in uh, planning and conducting a prescribed burn. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Maddie McIntosh. Thanks, Maddie. Again, we want to emphasize the importance of having a prescribed burn expert on your crew before you light anything. Safety is always the number one priority. Next up, Mark and Haley Miles of Ainsworth are working hard to boost their hometown by volunteering in their community and building their cattle operation for the future of their son, Bogue. The couple operate a family feedlot and graze stalkers on grass each summer with Mark's father, Bob. Recently, they started a herd of 200 cows of their own. Mark says that it's important for beef producers to be involved in their community because it offers a strong connection between Main Street and agriculture. You can read more about Mark and Haley in the April issue of Nebraska Farmer. Time now for weather with Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist and Market Journal Chief Meteorologist Al Dutcher. Al felt pretty warm out there earlier this week before some storms and showers passed through. What does the week ahead look like for us? Well, it's right with that warm weather we had earlier in the week. We've seen temperatures widespread 80s, almost pushing the 90 degree mark. Very dry air, unfortunately, and then we've seen that upper air low move its way into the central United States, cut off and spin around just as it was predicted last week. It was a little bit more intense cold on the back side of it than was predicted. A little bit longer warmth on the front side of it, but the overall impacts were the same. Continuous generation of thunderstorms on the front side, wrapping around during the afternoon, evening hours, and then coming down the back side of it during the overnight hours. 
and we got several rounds of those bands of precipitation moving through eastern Nebraska and the cumulative effects was generally between one and two inches was very very common for the eastern one-third we didn't really see much of any significant moisture across the southern panel in the southwest and unfortunately they're the ones that needed the worst in terms of the drought for Nebraska so we do have another system coming in earlier in the middle of next week it does give us an opportunity for several rounds of precipitation for western Nebraska. This might be the best significant moisture we've seen over the last three weeks. So as we go to the upper air models, we'll draw your attention that the system that was responsible for our upper air low parked over the central United States has now shifted to the east. We have a trough to our west, northwest that is going to start to push into the northern plains as we go through the weekend. So we're going to get a break between systems, a little bit of clearing activity, a little bit of southerly flow. It's going to warm our temperatures up to normal to slightly above normal as a trailing precipitation in southeastern Nebraska is really during the morning hours with associated with this system. And then by as we get into tomorrow, that upper air low parks itself over north central North Dakota as this movement takes its movement toward the east. Low pressure over the Texas Panhandle doesn't have a lot of Gulf moisture as this system is intercepting it. So this is a local moisture associated with the Pacific Ocean. And then as we go into Monday, that system starts to cut off as we get it over south central portions of Minnesota and essentially there's not a lot of moisture associated with this coming from the Gulf so it's basically localized moisture and that's why we don't see real hot heavy precipitation amounts associated with the snowfall across the northern plains and then the system basically cuts off and parks itself over the western Great Lakes as we go into Tuesday and that extends itself backwards and that means that cooler air will remain in place across the northern plains and that will probably have an impact on Nebraska as we basically stay in the cooler areas of the 50s and the 60s. Then we see an upper air low start to develop over the west Western, high, western uh, United States and itself cuts off and as it does so it's going to shift energy around the, at the surface coming out of the southwest and that will help to generate moisture over the Rocky Mountains and some of that may start to make its way into northeastern Colorado but the better chance starts to come on Thursday as this trough begins to try to open up somewhat it's going to wrap pieces of energy around it and those are going to come out toward Nebraska and the Central Plains and we will start to see some overrunning precipitation basically setting up over the southwest and the panhandle and then Friday as that trough begins to broaden out we get more activity moving around that trough and this system looks to be a really good one in terms of precipitation for western Nebraska as it starts to bring an overrunning moisture into portions of the southwest and south central and then that will start to slide toward the east. The biggest question is will this uh, system itself cut off or slowly spin itself toward the east. So overall good chances for moisture. Look even farther, 8 to 14 next Thursday to the following Tuesday, below normal temperatures. And in terms of precipitation, below normal precipitation, although there are signs that another system will start to enter in next weekend and give us some more moisture across the western part of the state. Thanks, Al. Finally today, Greg Ibach is back in Nebraska and at the University of Nebraska as IANR's inaugural Undersecretary in Residence. And if that's a name that sounds familiar to you, that's because Greg served as the director for the Nebraska Department of Agriculture for many years. Most recently, he worked in Washington, D.C. as the USDA's Undersecretary for Marketing and Regulatory Programs during the Donald Trump administration. He sat down to talk with me about what he wants to bring to his new role. I think what Dr. Bame has asked me to do is bring my my experience as a farmer and rancher myself, uh, my experience as a state agency uh, head of a Department of Agriculture, as well as my federal experience together and take a look at the programs and projects that the Institute is working on and see how I might be able to make uh, my past experiences relevant to help advance uh, what they're working on today. What do you see as maybe one or two of the biggest issues impacting Nebraska farmers right now? Well, Nebraska farmers are going to be adapting to uh, policies of a new administration. And we know from the comments that Secretary Vilsack has made already that uh, uh, climate change uh, and uh, carbon sequestration and regenerative agriculture are all things that he's interested in. So how can we work from a Nebraska producer point of view through our organizations or through the university to try to make sure that programs at USDA are designed that we can work with, we can benefit from, and that accomplish good goals for having sustainable agriculture and being able to keep our farms and ranches pro profitable. Because it seems like, you know, from the farmers that I talk to, everyone's very interested in 
sustainable ag, in helping the environment, helping the climate, but they want to do it in in a way that's cost effective for them and that isn't going to eat into their bottom line too much. I think that our experience with uh, a lot of these programs and even some of the private companies that are coming into this arena wanting to reward farmers for certain farmer farming practices, they're ignoring the things that farmers have already done and already put into place, rotational grazing or no-till farming. And I think that we need to switch from these uh, uh, practices and a practice focus, did I do this or that, into an outcome focus. And if we do that, then we'll look at what does the farm con contribute to nutrient management? What does it contribute to carbon sequestration, if that's important? What does it contribute to water quality? And if we look at that, a lot of farmers are doing things today if we get credit for what we've already done as well as what we're willing to do in addition to that. Uh, we're going to have a better chance to be able to reap benefits from a conservation focus than just have expenses or be penalized by that focus. More than anybody, you are very in tune with what farmers need. So do you have any final advice for farmers? Last 30 seconds, the floor is yours. I think more than anything right now as we're finishing up a calving season or some farmers in western Nebraska are starting calving season as we're starting to plant crops, we're going to get into a busy time of year where people are scrambling. And you know, being safe on the farm, being safe on our roads is very important. You know, we need all of Nebraska's farmers uh, to be able to feed the world and uh, we just want everybody to be safe and be here for fall harvest. Thanks again to Greg. We'll be sure to check back with him from time to time for any important updates. That's going to do it for this week's show. If you missed a story, be sure to download the Market Journal mobile app or follow us on social media to join in on the conversation. And don't forget, you can get the latest updates on the fight against coronavirus at covid19.unl.edu. Hope to see you right back here next time. I'm Troy Moling. Thanks for watching. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.